Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you again. I got a new Bible, in case you're interested. It's not as uh, beaten up as my old one. I heard someone say once, though, if your Bible doesn't look beat up, people assume you're not a very good Christian. So uh, hopefully, hopefully you won't judge me. Um, but yeah, so we're in Exodus chapter 10 today, starting in verse 21. And as we approach this passage, I, I would like to start by asking a question. Have you ever been in a situation in your life, and I'm sure you have, where one person's attitude ruins the party for everybody? <laughs> I mean, if you're in a family, if you have siblings, if you work with people, you know how like one person can literally derail an entire situation and, and ruin it for everybody else. And actually, just this week, I had a coworker um, tell me a story. He was traveling um, just over a week ago from uh, Phoenix, and I think he was going to North Carolina. And as he was traveling, he was, he was on a plane, and they boarded the plane in Phoenix. And when they got on the plane, everything seemed to be going a little smoothly. The, the flight was slightly delayed, but not too bad. Uh, he was really excited to go back and see some family. And then during the takeoff, after they'd closed the gate and they were starting to taxi to the runway and they were going through all the safety stuff, someone was still on their phone. There was a guy there and he was being a little obnoxious, using some vulgar language and um, essentially interrupting everyone going through their safety spiel at the beginning of the flight. And so someone politely asked him, uh, can you please be quiet? <laughs> And for whatever reason, I don't know what the guy was on the phone about or what the situation was, but he just lost it and, and escalated the situation, refused to be quiet, continued arguing with the people until finally the flight attendants had to get involved and, and the guy was, just became more and more angry, loud, belligerent, vulgar, to the point where they threatened him and said, like, if, if you don't stop this, we're going to have to remove you from the plane. And he said, fine, take me off the plane, I'm done with this. I don't want to be here anymore. So for some reason, this man wanted to fly from one side of the country on some sort of a trip and then decided that that was a lower priority than him being able to be as angry as he wanted. So they had to taxi all the way back to the gate, remove him from the plane, and then after like a couple of hours and going through all the procedures again, my friend finally was able to get to where he was going about five hours late. And all the people probably missed their flights. The amount of of problems that happened just because one person refused to participate was, was pretty astounding. And, it, and it's irrational and it doesn't make sense. There, the amount of darkness in this guy's mind must have been you know, beyond whatever he could handle. And as, as we look at the book of Exodus today, we see a similar thing happening. So this is only our uh, maybe third sermon of going through this um, showdown, if you will, between Moses and Pharaoh, God and the gods of Egypt. And in this showdown, we've seen at the very beginning, you know, Jeremy talked about the snakes and how God's snake ate the other snakes. And then Josue covered another one of the plagues. But if, if you know the way that the plagues work, there's that, that first initial sign with the snake, and then there's nine kind of normal plagues. And if you look at the book of Exodus, the way that uh, Moses has laid this out, there's actually each one of those sets of three is almost like a cycle. And so as you look at the cycle, you see that God sends Moses and he says, go talk to Pharaoh in the morning. So he meets him first thing in the morning. He threatens him. Pharaoh refuses to comply. A plague comes. And then the next time around, he goes, he meets him kind of inside in the middle of the day. He tells him the same thing on like the next round of the plague. Doesn't comply. Plague happens. Eventually that's done. And then the third one, without warning, God says, just do this. And it happens. And that happens three times. So we're in the third one right now. So we have seen up to this point, um, these plagues also begin to escalate in intensity. So the first ones were kind of a nuisance. You know, you had blood in the river. The river was red. They couldn't drink it, so they had to dig wells elsewhere. Then they had frogs everywhere that just stunk up the land and were annoying. And then you got the gnats, and they were, they were biting people. And then after the gnats, the next round kind of amplifies a little bit. You've got these swarming flies. You've got the... Um, You've got the uh, livestock just dying, which is, would be fairly catastrophic for these people. And then you've got all the people actually themselves getting sick. They've got boils everywhere. They're in a horrible amount of suffering. 
And then, after that, you've got this brutal hail that just knocks down, kills animals, and knocks down all their crops so that their crops are ruined for the year. And then after that, a whole other swarm of locusts has come in, and they're eating all their crops. So the nation is devastated at this point. They don't have, they don't have any food. Their, their, their prospects for the future are, are almost gone. And then finally, here we are at number nine, getting really exciting, darkness. And then the final escalation after this is going to be a lot of death. And as all of this is going on, we see that Pharaoh is refusing to comply as things get worse and worse. And God is putting more and more pressure on Pharaoh. And he is, he is still refusing to comply. He's starting to allow, he's trying to negotiate, and he's, he's loosening up some of his terms in this negotiation and letting a few things go here and there, but he's still not obeying God. And so as all of this is going on, we're, we're seeing how the Lord is proving to Pharaoh and to all the people of Egypt and to Israel and to every nation around that he is a greater, more powerful God than anything they knew. Uh, as I mentioned before, each one of these, sort, these, these kind of uh, plagues is, is related to some sort of a god or something that they worship. And Pharaoh himself is viewed as this represent, representative of God on earth. And Moses and Aaron are God's representatives on earth, showing that the God of Israel is the true God, who's more powerful. There's no other God like him. And so as he's showing his authority over Pharaoh, he's also showing his authority over all of the pantheistic gods of the Egyptians. And, and Pharaoh clearly is not going to comply, and so the Lord, as he's putting pressure on him, he keeps insisting that he must, that Pharaoh must come to the terms that God has brought to the table. There's not going to be some in-between here. And finally, we're at the point, just in, in the previous passage, at the, in verse 7 of this story, where even Pharaoh's servants are saying, what are you doing? Like, how long are we going to keep doing this? Just, just let these people go. But Pharaoh is hardening his heart. He's like that guy on the airplane who says, no, I'm going to fight this one out for, for whatever reason. And now we're getting to this last, highest, most intense plague in this cycle of nine. The next one will be really in, in the view of, of the book of Exodus, the last plague is really simultaneously happening with them leaving. So plague 10 is, is basically in the, the initiation of the Exodus. They're leaving. So these nine are really the core plagues. And then the final one is just what pushes them over the brink and allows them to go. And you can see that because it's separated from all the rest of them in this story. And as, as we move on, uh, Plague 10 gets a lot more airtime, if you will. And so as we, we dive into this passage, this specific passage about this ninth plague of the darkness, God is showing in this story that, that you can either live hardened in darkness or you can fully submit to God. Again, you can either live your life hardened in darkness or you can fully submit to God. So please pray with me and then let's look right at this passage. Father, we praise you that you are a glorious God. We praise you that you, our God, have authority over all nations, over all kingdoms, over all other supposed gods, and that you deliver your people. Lord, I pray that you would cause us to come out of darkness and into light today as we serve you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So verse 21, starting in the, the first section, I believe we see darkness. The darkness of the plague is the theme of these first three verses. I'll read them. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. So, in accord with the rest of the sequences that, we mentioned, that I mentioned before, the cycles, there was no warning for this plague. God just told Moses to do it, lift your hand towards heaven, 
darkness will fall on the land of Egypt. And so Moses obeys God. And then darkness falls. The significance of this from a theological standpoint is that the people of Egypt worshipped a god. I'm sure you've all heard of him. His name was Amun-Ra. And he was viewed as the national god of the people of Egypt. He was their supreme god, the, the head of their pantheon, kind of like Zeus would have been, say, for like the Greeks. This Ra god was the biggest, highest one. And he was thought to be the divine father of the pharaohs. So not only is he the highest god, but he's the one that gave the people their king pharaoh to be in charge of them, according to their belief system. And in this, God is saying, I'm greater than your God, your greatest God, and I'm greater than your king. I'm in charge. You thought that the light came from your God? I control light and darkness. This is what God is saying to the people of Egypt and showing to the people of Israel. And so not only is this significant um, for the people of Egypt, but it's, it's also something almost, it's not like we're, we're just seeing, imagine like an eclipse or something. What, what we're seeing here is that all light, all signs of goodness in the land of Egypt are gone. So some people, you, you look at the passage, and, and in our translations, and in, in most translations in English, there's a phrase that says something like a darkness to be felt, or a darkness that you could feel, or something like that. And although it's unclear what that phrase itself means, whether it means it kind of feels cold or darkness that seeps into your bones, some people have tried to take that approach with it. Other people who have less of a belief in, in God's ability to, to do supernatural things view this as something like a sandstorm that would have just encompassed, for some reason, just a very specific place in Egypt. Uh, I, I don't think the sandstorm idea is, is really compelling at all. One, because it... it normally assumes from those interpreters that, that God can't actually do miraculous things. And, and in addition to that, the people knew what sandstorms were. So if they wanted to talk about a sandstorm, they could have explained it in those, those sorts of terms. But the fact that it is this oppressive darkness over the people of Egypt, and yet there's, there's just normal light over here with the people of Israel, shows that there's something powerfully miraculous going on. And, it, and it's not just something like an eclipse either, because they can't see anything. It's pitch darkness. And, and I don't know if we really have a very good conception of what this darkness would be like as modern, modern human beings, for that matter. Um, the passage says it's a darkness that can be felt. Or you could also translate it as a darkness of feeling or a darkness of groping. And when the Bible talks about God's curse um, later on the people of Israel that he's threatening if they don't follow him. So when, when the people come out of Egypt, God gives them a bunch of terms for what their lives should look like when they live in the promised land. And one of the things he's telling them is if you don't follow me, then a lot of curses are going to come on you, just like I put those curses on the Egyptians. And one of the curses that God says that he could bring on them in Deuteronomy 28 is this kind of darkness, this blindness that requires feeling or groping. The Lord says, I will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, and you shall grope at noonday as, a blind, as the blind grope in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways. And so this darkness is a sign of God's curse on the people of Egypt. And it's not just, I don't think, some kind of darkness that feels cold or whatever. It's the kind of darkness that a, that a completely blind person would experience. Or if you've ever been in pitch black in the middle of a cave underground or something where there's no light, you can't go anywhere without carefully feeling your way anywhere. It's terrifying. You, you don't know where to go. You don't want to walk. You don't want to move. And the passage tells us nobody wanted to move. Nobody wanted to go anywhere. They couldn't. They, wouldn't, they hardly wanted to get up. That's the kind of cursed darkness that falls on the land. And again, if you, th you think about it from our perspective as modern people, I don't think we think of darkness the same way that they would have back then. You see, with the advent of electricity in the last 150 years, we don't really ever experience darkness anymore. Um, fun fact is that the, the world's Columbian Exposition, Exposition, 
exposition, that happened in uh, Woodlawn was the first time that there was something like a lit town or a lit city in the world here in Chicago, the first time. And it amazed everyone. People were coming from around the world to see the World's Fair. And one of the most amazing things was that they could walk around a city at night and there were lights and there was, there was stuff. Like you could, you could actually see things at night. Because prior to that in human history, and especially way back then, when night hit, you shut down everything. The cities closed their gates. People didn't go out. Most work ceased. Anything that couldn't be done with like a candle or like a small torch was, was done. Night put an end to activities. And so when, when we think about that nowadays, we, we have to reflect on what, what that meant for them. So darkness was, the best they could do to deal with it was probably candles or a little lamp with oil in it or some kind of uh, a torch that would very quickly burn out. So you, you really couldn't go anywhere. And back then, the people that would actually be traveling around at night generally were the people up to no good. So the thieves, the criminals, the robbers, the, the only people out at this time of day were the ones who were trying to do something wicked. So they would close the gates, everyone would kind of batten down the hatches, and they would go to bed at night. And then they'd get up the next day and do what they needed to do. And so, as that was their experience with darkness, in a normal world, they still had the sun, they still had the moon and stars at night. So that even though it was dark at night, they could see something. And, and in the Bible, if you read in Genesis, it talks about how the moon rules the night, right? Cause, because there's enough if, especially in like a full moon or a pra- fairly full moon, there's enough light at night for you to see and get around with the moon. But here, the stars, the moon, the sun, everything is gone. They can't get up. They can't go anywhere. It's not safe. And this, to them, would have felt like a horrible judgment. They understood darkness to be some sort of a curse, some sort of a precursor to death that was happening in their land. And if you can imagine, for three whole days, I mean, the, the mindset of the people there, and you know, Pharaoh himself and all of his people thinking, what happened? Like, the, the natural order has been completely disrupted. The sun no longer rises. The most reliable thing that we ever experience, the sun coming up each day, is not happening. And if you think of us nowadays, if, if we get like a few days straight of just clouds and gloom, People tend to get depressed, like, man, this is awful. Why do we live here? Can I just go live somewhere where there's most sunlight? Like, those are the experiences that we have with, with just light that's dim from the clouds. But pitch black for days. You can imagine how people's minds are wandering. They're like, the, the sun is what I need to grow my crops. I can't do my job. I can't go to work without light. I can't sell. I can't buy. I can't feed my family. When is this going to end? And that, that worry and that anxiety begins to ex- escalate to some sort of a, a little panic and a terror. And this just sense of dread and doom. After three whole days of pitch darkness, no one moving anywhere. The curse of God is on the people. And if you look elsewhere in the Bible, this idea of darkness being representative of the, the curse of God is, is all over. And I can just show you a couple places in the New Testament. So the darkness is viewed as a kind of judgment, but also as something that, that is related to the sinful mindset and disposition and actions of people who live in darkness in the Bible. So in biblical language, we see that this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So darkness is a sign of the world apart from God in sin and disaster. And then it's also a sign, it's also used as a symbol of the final curse, the final judgment that God will bring on the world. Jesus is going to bring darkness on the world of those who reject him. So Jesus, in, in his parables multiple times, you'll probably know this saying, he says, have that worthless servant, the one who's not really a servant, have that servant thrown into the outer of darkness, in that place where there's weep, weeping and gnashing of teeth. So this darkness represents God's final judgment on the people of Egypt, and especially on Pharaoh. But if you look at the passage again, there's, there's one little nice positive thing that we capture in this. It says, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. So God, in some of these plagues, and specifically in this one, is 
differentiating between the people that are under the curse and the people that are being blessed. God is in the process of saving his people and delivering them, bringing them out of darkness and into light, and he's bringing salvation. So this sign of them having light is a sign of salvation for the people of Israel. And that same language is used again throughout the Bible and in the New Testament. We see the, in the book of John, he uses this theme of light and darkness often. And he says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That light, that light was Jesus in the New Testament. And Jesus spoke to them, and he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And then later he says, I've come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. So, before we move on to the next step in this story, I think we should dwell here just a second and ask, do you experience darkness in your life? Are you like the guy who can't control himself sometimes, where, where your anger or your, your, your self-control is just gone, where you do not want to obey God and you'd rather do things contrary to God's will? Are you in darkness? Because if you are, you can be in the light if you follow Jesus. There is hope, there is salvation through faith in Jesus. He brought light into the world, and the darkness, even the, this darkness, can't overcome Jesus' light. And from a practical standpoint, we have to ask, what does it look like to be in darkness and to be in light when it's not obvious like it was in the story. And I think we can see that in the very next section in verses 24 through 26. So first we had the darkness and now we have service. I'll read that for you. It says, Then Pharaoh called Moses and he said, Go, serve the Lord. Your little ones also may go with you. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind. For we must take them to serve the Lord our God. And we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive there. So if you remember in the beginning of the book of Exodus, the people of Israel were in harsh service, very hard service in chapter 1. The word was used repeatedly. They were serving Pharaoh. They were serving the Egyptians. They were enslaved. And here, the Lord is calling to have these people come and serve him as their good God who will bless them as a result of their service. And in this passage, Pharaoh is refusing to serve the Lord. He's refusing to obey the Lord. Just like he did at the beginning, now we know that, that he has said, just previous to this, when, when he was first asked, he said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. and Moreover, I will not let Israel go. So Pharaoh's digging in his heels and his resistance to God's will is his refusal to serve the Lord, his refusal to be obedient. And as this goes on, he starts to get a little more obedient, begrudgingly. Again, as a, note, and a, as a negotiation tactic, he's starting to let more and more things go. But here, he will only allow partial service of the Lord from God's people. And he's only going to serve partway. He's still trying to negotiate. And so he says, okay, a given now, yeah, you can, the adults can go, the men can go, but I'll, I'll even let like, the whole family go. You can take your kids with you. He's so generous. You can, you can take your children to church with you. And although that is an improvement, he won't let them take any of their possessions with them. So in that time, if you think about the possessions of the people of Israel, they were herdsmen. They were, they were forced in this like slavery servitude so they were construction workers by force. 
But most of the possessions that they would have had would have been the things that they'd brought with them, their flocks and their herds and, and the things that they could uh, buy and sell were probably coming from this, these activities. And so by saying, you can go, you can have a nice little church service out in the wilderness, but you can't bring any of your stuff with you, he was basically going to rob them. And not only that, but, but they wouldn't be able to actually go serve the Lord fully because they would, have so much, they, they would have so much worry over all of their possessions back here that they'd probably have to leave people behind because it's not just like piles of money or something that are locked away in a safe. You have to maintain flocks and herds. You have to feed them. You have to take care of them. So really only some of the people could go and they would have to leave others behind to care for those unless they were being robbed completely by Pharaoh. So... Pharaoh offers partial service. But Moses isn't having it. He says, no, we need to fully serve the Lord our God. That means not just ourselves, not just my family going to church on the weekend. It's not just me going out into the wilderness to have a nice little religious ceremony and then coming back. I have to take absolutely everything I have, all of my possessions, everything. It's got to go with us. We don't know what God's going to require of us. God could ask us for anything once we're out there. He might ask us to, suffer, to, to offer for sacrifices this kind of animal or that kind of animal or all of these kinds of animals, and we're willing to do it. We are taking all of it with us, and we're going to serve the Lord fully and completely with all of our possessions. And I think this also applies to us in the sense that when we're called to follow Jesus, when Jesus calls us to follow him as disciples, we don't just offer him a partial service. We don't even just offer him religious activities periodically. We actually offer him all of ourselves. And that includes all of our time, our energy, all of our priorities should be around service to the Lord. And that even means our possessions, like our money. Like we should be willing to give that and we should be regularly giving that. And, and being ready to see where God is working in the world and what he's doing so that we can help contribute to that. We should be viewing our lives as believers, like Moses was, as, as stewards. And all of our possessions as things that really belong to God that he's given us to care for, that he might ask for at any time in our lives. And Jesus brings this up quite a bit as well. Remember his teachings about money? Unlike Pharaoh... He knew, like Moses knows, that you, you can't really have two gods. You can't have two different things you're worshiping in your life. Jesus tells us, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and he will love the other, he'll be devoted to one, or he'll despise the other. You can't serve God and money. One of them's in charge. One of them's always in charge. So we see Pharaoh's in darkness. He refuses full service. The people of Israel, they're in light, and they want to offer full service to the Lord. So you can either choose that, hardness and darkness, or fullness in serving the Lord. And then finally, let's look at the last section here. The hardness, the hardening. 27 to the end, he says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take care never to see my face again. For on the day that you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. The Lord hardens his heart. Pharaoh gets angry. He, he digs his heels in even further. He decides to fight even more. And he says, negotiation's done. This is over. Go away. Never come back. If you come back, I will kill you. There's no more negotiating. Pharaoh has, has drawn his line in the sand and he's saying, this is the end. I'm done with this. And the insanity of Pharaoh at this moment is, is just beyond what, what a normal person could comprehend. His nation is in ruins. He's got nothing. All of his people are saying, what are you doing? Let them go. And yet he is hardened in his darkness, in his anger, and in his refusal. And he actually threatens to kill Moses, the guy who's speaking to him on behalf of the great God who just proved that he's better than anything Moses has or, or anything Pharaoh has going for him. And now he's making threats, as if somehow Moses is the one doing this. 
when, when he can't touch the Lord. He can't hurt God. God is sovereign. And so just the insanity of this interaction on its face when you think about it, and, and you can tell that it, it actually makes Moses very angry as well. So we see later on that Moses is mad in, in, in chapter, uh, chapter 11, just in the same passage. So this isn't the end of this conversation. They, they go back and forth a little bit before Moses leaves. And then in verse 8, it says... Uh, where is that? And it says, and he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. So their negotiations broke down, escalated to this point. Pharaoh is not giving in. And our story ends. We'll uh, get to see more of this in the coming weeks as we look at the rest of the Exodus. But there's one thing that I I wanted to focus on today because I don't think we've covered it in really any of the discussions. And this is something that's very important in the story of Exodus. It's a strong theme. And it is this idea of hardening and the hardness. So this passage tells us that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. But if you look back through this, and and you could do that as an exercise at some point, we see that, that Pharaoh sometimes hardens his own heart in the story. Sometimes it's listed as, as the heart passively being hardened. It's, there's, no, there's no active subject. It's just his heart is hardened. And then sometimes the Lord himself is the one hardening Pharaoh's heart. So we see all three of these represented here. And, and I think this is very significant. Um, and it's, it's significant because of the way that we view how God interacts with people throughout the rest of the Bible. And, and the way that we understand God's relationship to his world. So Pharaoh hardens his own heart. His heart is somehow hardened by something, and we don't know what. And then sometimes God actively hardens the hearts of people. And so there's there's two truths that I think we can take from this and that we'll see elsewhere in the Bible that we, we need to think about when we think about this idea of hardening and God and how he reacts and how he interacts with people. The Bible makes two things very, very clear. And this story has probably shown us that as you've, as you've seen it and experienced it and listened to it read and heard it preached. The first is that God is in control of absolutely everything. God is in control of all circumstances. He's in control of everything that happens in nature. And he's also in control of people. God controls everything. And the other truth that we can't avoid, that we can't pretend doesn't exist either, which creates this tension, is that people also make decisions and do things and are very responsible for what they do. So the, the Bible doesn't portray a God who is kind of aloof and just watching things kind of devolve or improve. The Bible gives us a God who runs the world, who's in charge, who rules as a king. He is sovereign. And yet the Bible also shows us that people aren't just robots. They're not just like actors playing a game. People, it's not like a fatalistic world where I'm not responsible for what I do because you know that was just what I was, I was put here to do. This is, there's, there's a real dynamic at play in the Bible that's almost beyond and is I think beyond our comprehension that, that God is fully in control of all things and everything that happens happens according to the way that God planned it to happen, including who believes, who doesn't believe, who obeys and who doesn't believe, or who doesn't obey, and also people are accountable, responsible, and will be either rewarded or punished for the things that they do. And and when he's talking about this, um, the Apostle Paul looks at the Exodus as an example of, of how this works. So I'll just read you a couple excerpts from what he says. Paul says, for he says to Moses, that is, God says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or on exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. He has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. So God is 
actively hardening Pharaoh here. And why did it say here? It, said it, it says it elsewhere. So that God can display his wonders and the glory of what he's doing in this story that's working out in the Exodus through Pharaoh. So that everybody everywhere in the world will hear the amazing things that happened here and will know that there is one God who is the great God who delivers his people. So God is sovereign over that. But Pharaoh is still just as responsible. And to, it's not just in this situation that God is sovereign over a king. We're told later on in the book of, of Proverbs that God is actually in control of the hearts of all rulers. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 21, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. So when rulers make decisions any time in human history, God is moving things around. God is causing things to happen. It's like a little puddle of water that he's playing with. God is, God is causing things to happen in the world, but yet not in such a way that people aren't still responsible and actively involved in the decisions. It's like the wills of people somehow always align with the will of God in the world. At least the will of God in the sense that it's accomplishing what God wants to accomplish in his plan. Not necessarily accomplishing what God is telling them to do when he's giving them commands. So there's a lot here, and I could talk about this forever in theology. But God, our God, is great, and he's beyond our comprehension. And this is actually the way that he works with all human beings. So if you look in the book of Romans again, when, when Paul is talking about the fall of humanity and, and how sin has spread through the world, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and against all unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness, they suppress the truth. So people don't like the truth, and they push the truth down. And then he says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. So Pharaoh, in this same situation, knows what's going on. He's seen it. He doesn't need anyone to explain to him that the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, is the true God. And yet he does not want to worship him. And so he's not honoring God and he's not giving thanks to God. And so then he's becoming futile in his thinking. His foolish heart is darkened. And then Paul tells us that God proceeds to give people over to their sin. So when people rebel against God, the consequences are that they, they, they plunge themselves into darkness and that they're actually hardened. So they're, they, they go even further into the sin. They like, they, they, they're given to lusts that are, that are uh, dishonoring to their bodies. People give in to activities that are shameful, that are self-destructive. They continue to refuse to worship the God of the Bible. And Although this is a little theology lesson on the relationship of God and the world, sovereignty over responsibility, it's, it's very practical for us today because it doesn't mean that, like, that your life doesn't matter and that you don't have a choice here. Because you don't know God's sovereign plan in the world. You don't know how God directs things in hearts. And what you do know is how you respond and what you're responsible for. So we hear elsewhere in the Bible, do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. Serve the Lord. Peter tells us that, that God actually removes people from darkness, and he says he, proclaims, uh, he, he causes them to proclaim the excellencies of him who called them out of darkness and moved them into his marvelous light. The God of the Bible actually wants the people who claim that they believe in him the ones who trust in Jesus and say that they're going to obey him fully, who are not in the darkness but are in the light, to go out and do what he told Paul to do. The Lord said, I'm sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God and that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So if you are in rebellion against a God, if you're in darkness or if you're trying to offer partial service, I would beg you, this passage shows us, you can either live hardened in darkness or you can fully serve the Lord. Do not harden your heart today. Don't, don't harden your heart like Pharaoh did. Turn to, the God, turn to God. You can trust in Christ. 
He is the light of the world. He can deliver you. You don't have to stay in darkness. You can repent. You can believe the gospel. You can fully serve the Lord. You can turn from darkness. You can turn to light and trust in Jesus. Please pray with me. Father, I thank you for your truth. Father, we, we praise you that you are so beyond our comprehension. We praise you that you are in control of the world, able to control nature, and yet you are also able to work in our hearts, to work in our minds, and to save us. We praise you that you have saved us by your grace alone. Father, I pray that people in here, in the hearing of my voice, those that, that hear later would, would not continue in darkness, hardening their hearts. Father, I pray that, that people would fully serve you. I pray that we, that I would fully serve you and not hold back anything from Christ. I pray this in his name. Amen.